heart for the Lord. Come, let's go up to the mountain, He will teach us His ways. Come, let's go up to the mountain. Come, let's go up to the Lord. Come, let's go up to the mountain, He will teach us His ways. Come, come, let's go up to the mountain. Come, let's go up to the Lord. Come, let's go up to the mountain, He will teach us His ways. Come, let's go up to the mountain. Come, let's go up to the Lord. Come, let's go up to the mountain, He will teach us His ways. But there's some good stuff in here. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff about the, uh, about the nature of the sacrifice, the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and, and such uh, as, that are important for us. And we've touched on, you know, we've seen a few of them. Uh, one of the things that I was wanting to just, just hit on is that concept of the, of the fire. You look at chapter 6, uh, verse 12. It says, you know, the fire on the altar is to be kept burning. And it must not go out. Okay? It's kept burning. It's got to be maintained. It's got to... I mean, how hard is it to keep a fire going and burning? What do you have to do to, to keep it going? Putting fuel on there. You have to keep refueling it. Yeah. What else? Feed it. Feed it, yeah. Fan it. Fan it into flame, yeah. Yeah. What about when it rains? Cover it. Yeah. Yeah, see, I, was, I kept picturing when I was reading that... Uh, of some poor priest out there standing with an umbrella holding it over the fire. <laughs> is, that how, is that how it works? The, fire, the altar covers it. Oh, the altar covers it. <laughs> you don't need an umbrella when the altar covers You don't need an al- umbrella? Well, but it was such a fun picture, though. I just thought that would be an interesting picture. So it's it's supposed to be kept burning. In other words, it's... So even if you did have to use an umbrella, what big deal is that, keeping the God's fires burning? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, something like that. <laughs> I mean, can you think about? It? You're keeping it lit at all times. You're never supposed to let it go out, even when it rains. You know. So imagine, imagine the neglect it would take to let it go out. I mean, this is not a small fire, is it? No. And, and it's not going to. It's not going to just snuff out in an instant, is it? It would take a. How long would it take for that fire to actually go out? Several days. It would take a while. I mean, they're clearing the ashes. That's one of the things that it says. It says every morning the priest will burn wood on the fire. He is to arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat uh, fat portions from the fellowship offerings on it. Um, Where does it say that? They're supposed to not let the. Uh, he, they're supposed to Kaylee take. Kaylee Fox, come to the front. Kaylee Fox, come to the front. I missed that. Yeah, you said it was six twelve, but I don't think it's the ashes. It's, it's ten. Verse ten. Verse ten is where it says that about removing the ashes. Yeah, he's supposed to remove the ashes of the burnt offering and the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. So he's. They're constantly clearing off the old ashes. But they're constantly putting new stuff, new wood and things on there. So, I mean, it would take a, it would take a lot of neglect for this fire to go out over a course of days. It would take for this fire to really go out to a point where you could not get it started up again. Where there's not a single ember left that you could use to rekindle a new fire. So he is to arrange the burnt offering. He says, fire must be kept on the altar, kept burning on the altar continually, and it must not go out. Would you want to be that guy on duty when it goes out? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, I'd, be, I'd be really fearful of that one. <laughs> yeah, you would not want to be the one to, to let it go out, to be so not paying attention to be so asleep on the job that it goes out on your watch. I mean, what, what kind of repercussions would happen to you, do you think, if it went out on your watch? Yeah, I don't think you'd be a priest anymore. You don't think you'd be a priest anymore? Well, I, I like those, that's, and I, I, this is, I like those <laughs> Southwest Airlines commercials. Have you seen those, those commercials from a few years ago? Where uh, the, the one that I like the best 
is, is this, this woman who's having trouble with her contacts and she's just blinded by the contact going wrong and she runs into the bathroom and gets standing in front of the mirror so she can fix her contact and she finally blinks and is able to see and she looks around and she's in the men's room. Oh, good. Have y'all seen that one? You've never seen that one? Well, do y'all remember what the tagline is of all of those commercials? It's, well, the Southwest Airlines, it's the, do you want to get away? <laughs> it's one of those kind of moments that, uh, and you imagine, this would be the priest guy, if he let the fire go out, he's like, Lord, just get me out of here. <laughs> Take me anywhere else but here. Get, put me on the next flight. Well, he would be fearful of God, though, at this point. He would be fearful of God, that's he true. <laughs> He's like, Lord, let your judgment pass over me. <laughs> I was taught that the priest actually would serve barefooted mm -hmm. so that they don't fall asleep because the, the ground's cold and keep them awake. Mm -hmm. it, um, would, it would help yeah. in that, but I would, I would think, you know, eventually your feet would get used to it. I mean, I don't know. But, I don't but know. if there are hot embers bouncing around every once in a while, that cold floor <laughs> on a hard ember with a bare foot, would, yeah. that would wake you up. That would wake you up, or what they would need, maybe what they would need to do is just spread a bunch of child's Legos on the floor, and then walk around barefoot. I don't think so, dear. You don't think yeah, so? You're, you're getting into other religions there. <laughs> but those are some of the most painful things on the planet <laughs> when you step on them. Yeah, Legos. Yeah. So. Unless you're wearing shoes. That yeah. well, that's the whole Moms thing. Moms understand this. Yes. But it's it's. In order, to, you've got to keep this fire going. You've got to have your supply of wood. You've got to have people that are watching it. You've got to be making a concerted effort to keep it going because on its own, naturally, left to itself, it will go out eventually. If it is not tended, if it is not taken care of, it is going to go out at some point. And so... That's the situation. But now remember, who is it that lit this fire at the altar? The Levites. Well, they lit it, yes, yeah, sort of. But where did the fire come from? Because look over it in the next Torah portion, in the beginning of, cha of chapter 9. I'm cheating a little bit. Okay. In chapter 9, verse 24. I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. Well, we're not there yet. I know, I'm <laughs> cheating. That's why I said I was cheating. But uh, verse 23, going backing up, it says, Moses and Aaron then entered the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came from the Lord and consumed what? The burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted and fell face down on the ground. So who lit the fire? The Lord. The Lord did. He is the one who started the fire on the altar. And so when... No when wonder they don't want to the and they better not let that go out because this is the fire that God started. Same thing happens again with Solomon and the dedication of the temple. Fire comes out and it, it ignites that altar to make sure there's no doubt that his glory and his presence is there. And so even later on after that, Elijah. when Elijah comes along and he is having that confrontation with the, with the prophets of Baal, is there precedence for him to be able to have confidence to say, oh yeah, my God can light this fire. My God knows how to light a fire. And we've been keeping it burning ever since he lit it. So, you know, I can, I can, you guys can dance around and, and all 400 of you can cut on yourselves and get into a frenzy, but your God can't light a fire like mine can. And in fact, you know, he, he does it where he makes it more difficult, right? He does what to the, to the offering and to the altar that he builds? He, he fills water. He dumps, you know, gallons and gallons of water on this stuff. And is God still able to light it? Yes, he is. So, he knows how to do that. But that's like us today. I mean, we still have to fan the 
those flames within us. You're getting ahead of me now. Just like you got ahead You're cheating. <laughs> but now, now, think about this, though. How, <laughs> think about this. How do you think those priests and those people, you know, here's the fire that God lit and God started. How do you think they would feel if somebody came running up to the altar with a fire extinguisher oh, not to put it out? How do you think they would respond to that? I think they'd be jumping on them out of the way. Would, would, it be, would it be, excuse me, do you mind please getting that, not, don't use the fire extinguisher on the altor? Do you think, please? I think it would be more like, what do you think you're doing? Get away from here with that. They would, they would gently <laughs> escort him out? I don't know about gentle. You think the gentle part might not be? They would, I mean, he would be the equivalent of a, of a spiritual terrorist trying to put out the fire. Well, we have plenty of those around. And we have a lot of those. How many congregations and how many churches are filled with people who aren't really about building up the fire of God, but are more about putting the fire out? Sadly, that's in us. That's within the people of God. There are people trying to put out the fire of God. We, it's like we don't really want to see God move because when God starts to move, you know, we don't necessarily always have control of that, right? He begins to do things or ask, us, ask of us things that we may not always be comfortable with. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so in order to avoid that, people try to put out the fire. They don't want to see God move in that way. Then they become stagnant. And, and we become stagnant. So rather than a fire, the way I like to put it, you know, is one of the fun things for me growing up uh, and, and grilling and barbecuing and stuff like that is, is, you know, having the lighter fluid and spraying the lighter fluid on the fire while it's lit. You know, it has that big <laughs> explosion of stuff. You're really not <laughs> supposed to do that, are you? No. That's Were really bad. Briefly. No. Boy Scouts know better. Yeah, they do. And, and, and at times, you know, it does have a tendency to send your arm and other things like that. Ooh, gas, yeah. Oh man. Well, I, I've had it where it, it flamed up so much that it you know curls your eyelashes back a little bit. Uh, so that's always a, a risky, risky thing to do. But in in our congregations, in our lives, which would God rather us have in our possession, uh, a, a fire extinguisher or the lighter fluid? He would much rather have us have be carrying around a bottle of lighter fluid. And that's that's, yeah, praise. that's <laughs> praise. That's the passion that we have to approach and worship God. He wants us to have something in our possession that when we see a spark, when we see a fire in our own life, or when we see something maybe about to go out, that we have something that will reignite it with power. Yes, thank you. I like the song What's that now? Some people are talking. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, that's right. What's that? I said the wind, the spirit, the luach, the, that's the what keeps the fire going. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, we're supposed to have that within us to keep the fire going. We have everything we need to keep the fire going in our own lives. And you look at uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 30. This is, uh, this is as Yeshua, this is after the, uh, the resurrection. This is as they are on the road to Emmaus. You know, that uh, Yeshua is there. He is speaking with them. They urge him to stay with them to evening. It says in verse 30, Luke 24, verse 30 says, And it happened that when he was reclining at the table with them, he took the, the matzah, he offered the uh, abraka, the blessing, and breaking it, he gave it to them. Then it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him 
and he disappeared from them. And they said to one another, didn't our heart burn within us? Wasn't it set ablaze, as the way some of the translated puts it? Uh, burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. So who sets, who's the one that starts the fire in our hearts, in our lives? Yeshua does. And what's one of the means in which the fire is supposed to be ignited and, and, and not just ignited, but fanned into flame? What's one of the ways that Yeshua did it right here? Explaining the scriptures is supposed to be some of the fuel that gets our fire going. So he, just as he lit the fire at the altar, at the temple, at, uh, with, uh, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal, he ignites within us. And he, the explanation of the scriptures is one of the ways that gets that fire burning. And I know for me personally, in, in, you know, we've been on this journey for 10 years or so now. And that when, when the new insights from the scripture for things that we didn't understand before, the things that make more sense now, you know, now that we're looking at it from a, a messianic, from a Hebraic perspective, all of a sudden, man, that stuff's exciting in a way that it wasn't necessarily as exciting before. But it's like it's, it's that, that fire is getting some of the breath blown onto it, and so it's, it's picking it up. It's like somebody's spraying the lighter fluid on it. So the presence, you also know that the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit is supposed to set us on fire. Where do we see that happening? At Pentecost, right? At Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent and rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole, the whole house where they were staying in tongues, like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So again, who starts the fire? God, Spirit. The Holy Spirit. God does. He starts the fire within us. Of course, those first two go together because the Holy Spirit is the one who explains. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals and explains and teaches us and guides us in all truth. And that, that truth is always connected to the scriptures. It is the scripture. It's the word of God. So then we get to that point. Is it possible, not only do we see you know, people at work within congregations that want to douse the fire, is it possible for us to douse the fire in our own lives? Is it possible to neglect the fire in our own lives and let it go out? Yes, it is. What kind of things hap happen in our own life that cause, a, cause our fire to weaken or die down or die out? We neglect, neglect the word. What's that now? Troubles and testing. They either, one way or the other, either mm -hmm. you're going to give up or you're going to get on fire again. Yeah. So sometimes the trials and the tribulations and difficulties of life can do that. Neglecting the word can do that. Not reading and studying the word for yourself can let your fire go out. Having the discipline that God wants us to have in our lives. Rejecting his discipline. Well, even us being disciplined, the making ourselves sit down, read the word, even when you don't feel like it. The discipline that we're supposed to have as okay. his disciples. Okay, gotcha. Self-discipline to walk in his ways and to seek after him. Okay, what else? What other ways? Can we not also let the fire die down and weaken if we uh, break fellowship with one another and, and don't ga gather around other believers who love him? What, isn't that, doesn't that weaken us? A lot of strength and a lot of encouragement. Mm -hmm. Not praying, not seeking after him, not calling out to him, not worshiping. Not having a thankful heart. Not being thankful, but having a, a grumbling spirit will put out your fire. Or doing it with gas in your car. Yeah. Being a double-minded man, as James talks about, being tossed a, and by any wind of, of doctrine or change or whatever else like that. 
being unstable in all you do. That can help put out your fire. Yeah. What else? This is not an exhaustive list. You can probably all think of things. Giving place to the wrong emotions, such as anger and fear, okay. and being judgmental or critical or any of those things. Okay. That's really that's good. All of those are good. And even um, you know, trying to mix your life with things that are not of God, right? Saying, well, it's okay if I if I go over here and do this. I'll, I'll be fine. Right? And saying, this doesn't affect me. This doesn't bother me. Yeah. So mixing the holy with the profane? Mixing the holy and the profane. You can't mix the two. You know, all of those things can make our, our fire go out. We are supposed to keep ablaze that gift. That's one of the things that Paul says. We read this passage earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. We are supposed to keep that fire alive in us as well. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So why do you think Paul felt it necessary to say, I have to remind you to do this? Because it's, it's important. It's going to make a difference. Yeah. Because without someone there to remind us, we may not realize how important it is, you know, that we do this. We might not realize the implications or the significance of this fire that God starts in our life. And if somebody's not there to point us out and say, hey, wait a minute, man, something's, I can sell, something's not right with you. You know, I can tell that you're, you, don't, you don't seem to have that, that vibrancy or that life. You look really discouraged today. How's, how's your fire? I mean, what if we would ask ourselves, ask each other that question? How's, how's your fire? And people would look at us like, uh, what are you, nuts? I'm, I'm, I'm not on fire. That's the problem. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that might be the problem. Yes. And the branch cannot bear fruit unless you know abiding in the vine. We are to abide and rest in him. And only he can it, and really only he can bring the abiding uh mess in our hearts with him himself. We can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. It's still an act of God to keep us in him. We can't keep ourselves. And I would totally agree. Uh, I, I definitely would agree that, that he, he will not let the fire go out because I don't believe we would lose our salvation in that we regard. We would lose our salvation if that were the case. Right. But we can have, there is that vibrancy that we have in him. That, that, that we, we do have some recourse and a part of. You know, in Revelation, and we're speaking to the church of Ephesus, talks about you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this and then you're doing this and that's great but you lost your first For, love. you've forgotten your first love go yeah. back to what you were doing you did first yeah and you know I, I imagine you know for the priesthood there were plenty of things to do at that temple <laughs> I mean and you think about the beginning of it when they just got started there were only five of them and quickly after that, there was just three, <laughs> yeah. you know, for all those millions of people. And it, I, I'm sure if, if they weren't diligent 
and weren't um, disciplined and mindful of keeping that fire burning, that there were plenty of other things they could get caught up in real, real easy. You know, people bringing in sacrifices. They've got to slaughter this sacrifice, got to do this, and, you know, got to keep the fire on the lamp going, and got to make sure the shell bread's there and, and fresh every week, and all these other things that they had to do. And yet, that was, God is saying, don't forget this. Yeah. Don't forget to keep my fire burning. And I think that's what Paul, Paul is saying here, too. Don't forget to keep that fire, that excitement, that love, that passion you have for me. Keep, keep it burning. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's started by God. It's kept burning by God. But it does, I think, take some um, involvement on our part to not neglect. Mm -hmm. We have to be mindful not to neglect because we, we can be neglectful of our relationship with him. Seen that all too often. Oh, I've, I've been there. Every, every one of us has probably been there at some point where we, times where we have felt closer to the Lord and then times where we have felt farther away. And, and, and it gets even hard to pick up a Bible sometimes. Yeah, you know? you, like, even, like, even the desire. Presence is noticed, and other times it seems as though he's not as present when he's really mm -hmm. is. And there are, yeah, there are times where he deliberately pulls back a little bit to, to see, are, are we going to come after him? You know, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, when, when you see newborns and babies that are learning how to walk, the, the mom will be, or the dad will be sitting there saying, come on, come to me. And they'll start kind of teetering towards him a little bit. And then they'll take a step back and get a little bit further away. And the kid's like, Hey, wait, where are you going? You know, they say that too. So the kid, you know, the kid has further than to go. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes he does pull back and, and withdraw just enough to say, see if we'll notice. And if, we, and if he withdraws and pulls back and we don't notice, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Yeah. Sometimes we can get so busy doing what we think God's telling us to do that we neglect our relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Because we get so busy in the doing yes. of things. Sometimes you just have to pull back and it's like, okay, I, I, I need to work on my relationship. Because when you look at that passage, that Second Timothy passage, uh, to keep this ablaze, keep it going, fan into flame, you know, use those, those fireplace bellows type of things and, and blow on it, put the breath, the spirit upon it, uh, because... He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness. Mm -hmm. if, if you are ever in that position where your fire is, is neglected and out, then fear is all you've got. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be afraid. But when your fire is burning, when it's tended, when it's not neglected, when you know that you are uh, in, a, in a close walk with God, when you are right there with him, then it doesn't matter what is going on around you. I'm missing the verse. It's really like practicing the presence of God. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Second Timothy one six. Are you watching the giraffe? I watch the eagles and um, no. the, I, watch, I watch the penguins and different um, animals, you know, uh -huh. various and types. But the I see the Lord say, when you look at that webcam, you really realize how, how I am right there watching over you, mm -hmm. you know, 24-7, you know. Like he's right there, just, I mean, you're watching, like I'm watching the eagle and seeing them feeding those little ones and everything. Well, he's noticing me as I'm washing the dishes or I'm doing this or I'm mm -hmm. doing that. I mean, he sees you, you, all these We things. don't realize he's watching. Yeah, he, yeah, he is, you know. Well, it's... You realize every little detail of what you're doing, he's right there looking at what you're doing and everything else, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, he is. He is. Um, but yeah, it's if he is there with us at all at all times, and we keep that fire ablaze because 
apart from that, if we, we, we don't have that blazing fire, then, then when the persecution comes, when the difficulties come, when the, the trials and tribulations come, then we will panic and we will be afraid. But how many times do you hear those stories of, of the, the martyrs throughout church history or uh, in life you know, where you see people and their life is a mess and things are going crazy and everything's falling apart, but they have a peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of it. Because, and you ask them why, it's like, well, I just know that the Lord is going to take care of me. Yes, everything may be falling apart, but I'm not afraid. You see that in Revelation, you see, time and time again. It's, this calls for patient endurance. This calls for patient endurance. And, and so it, in that passage, it, it goes on to say, God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's what the fire is for. But he says, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. If your fire is ablaze with God, what, is, what are you going to have in your life? You're going to have power. If your fire is, uh, if you fan that flame into, into fullness, you're going to have power. You're going to have love. To love who? God. God. Love God and, God ourselves, and, and our, you know, our lives, uh, but others. Even those people who might be causing you trouble and might be that thorn in your side, are you going to have power to love them? Yes, and forgive too. And forgive. <laughs> Okay, but if you if that fire has dwindled and is being neglected, how's your love? Are you going to be willing to forgive? Are you going to be willing to love? Not so much. Makes me wonder if Adam ever forgave Eve. I should because, hope so. Well, you know, fear was never a part of man's equation until they fell. That's mm -hmm. when fear came into the picture. So fear is a result of sin. So if you're fearful then you have to kind of look at what's going on in your life. Sure. Fear is not our, it says, it's not given us a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. Right. Love and the power and the power. Right, that is what is available to us. Yeah. The spirit uh, of, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound judgment. Those are the things that are available to us. The problem is, we're not always taking advantage of what is available to us. We're not taking advantage of the power that's available to us. We're not taking advantage of the love that is available to us or the sound judgment that is available to us. Because if we neglect the fire, we're not interested in those things as much. And that's the very things that Eve lost. Because when she partook of that, she was not using sound judgment. No. You know, she lost her power because she definitely had power with God. He, you know... And, and along with that, if there are important decisions that you're trying to make, uh, things that are coming up that, that you, like, you don't know what to do or how to decide, then worshiping God, fanning that flame into fire, you know, getting that flame going, putting the lighter fluid on that fire, are, is that going to help or hinder you making a good decision? Help. Is getting closer to God ever going to make you make a worse decision? No. 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 And that kind of goes with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 as well. Because on that fire, you put that sacrifice. And this is where it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's God mercy, mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This then, is your spiritual yeah. act of worship. Yes. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by and the, the renewing, renewing of, of your mind. mind. That sound judgment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Then so, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it all goes together. If, you're, if the flame of your life is, is active and burning, you are closer to God, and it's, it's much more difficult to make a bad decision <laughs> because you're hearing from His Spirit. And if you're about to make a, a bad decision, what's the Spirit of God going to say to you? Whoa. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Quit. Stop. <laughs> and, what, and so another way of, of neglecting the fire or putting the fire out is to do what when that voice tells you to stop? To ignore it. You ignore it. Yeah. Ignoring the counsel of the Spirit will put out your fire or will dwindle the fire. Something that was pointed out this morning that I didn't know 
is the heart of the Torah, the very center verse of the Torah is Leviticus 8.8, 8, which is in our portion today. And it's all about the breastplate. You put the breastplate on, with the urn, and, and you know, here we have the whole armor of God right there. Um, yeah, so the heart of the Torah, well, he was saying Leviticus 8.8 8, and putting on the breastplate. That's good, that's good. And then the, well, one of the things I was going to mention, you know, we had that verse on there, Leviticus 8.23. This is related to a lot of this stuff. And this is... Oh, that's so good stuff. Yeah, about the putting of the, the blood on the ear, on the thumb, and on the, the, the great toe is what it's put. But you think about it, you're, you're covering your ear with the blood, Right? What is that? What will that accomplish? If you're cover, if you're covering what you hear with the blood, it's for what purpose? To filter what you're hearing. Yeah. To, so you will always but shema. It's just the tip. It's just the tip, it's just but it's it's the symbol. Right. Well, it doesn't want to. Yeah. It well, doesn't want to. It doesn't want to just like. The blood makes you hear, and the blood makes you do, and the blood makes you walk yeah. the way you're supposed to. So it's all it's covering. It's put on the ear, so you'll always shema God's command. Or your ear then becomes consecrated or set apart to only hear the holy things of God. Mm-hmm. That's what it's supposed to be. Your ear is, is, should be attuned to the holy things of God. You're, it's on your hand, on your thumb. You know, you, this is one of your strongest, this is your strongest muscle or your strongest finger is your thumb. Some people don't even call it a finger. <laughs> But it's so that you may always be, uh, you will always obey or do or carry out any of God's commands. So your hands, your ear is consecrated or set apart to only hear the things of God. Your hands are consecrated or set apart to only do the holy things of God. And then your feet, your toe, you know, you're always, you move quickly or you go anywhere to carry out the command of God. Or it's consecrated or set apart to only walk on the holy path of God. Right? So everything that you do, you're supposed to be set apart for to hear the things of God, to do the things of, him, of God, and to walk in his ways. That's, and, that's, and when you live like that, how's your fire going to be? Yeah, your fire is going to be a, a, a furnace. Your fire is going to be more like a forge. Because what happens when you have the fire, a fire so hot that it becomes a forge? What happens to all the impurities? It melts away. Yeah. It comes to the top. And it, it comes to the top. That's the dross. That's actually the next song that we're going to sing is Refiner's Fire.